Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Natalie Key, Knowledge Exchange Manager for Horticulture AHDB. During this webinar, we'll provide an update on the ongoing AHDB funded project looking at the detection and control of pathogens causing blotch and green mould in mushroom production. With the continued loss of plant protection products, rising levels of resistance and policy drivers heavily influencing what is available for crop protection within horticulture, AHDB's focus within our integrated pest management programme is to help the industry move towards a more sustainable future within crop protection. We hope to enable the industry to achieve this by establishing IPM best practice through the three strands of prevent, so for example, good hygiene practice, detect, improve monitoring and diagnostic, and control, looking at available plant protection products and alternative options for biological and cultural control. For more information on our wide work around IPM, please um, visit our information hub, which is signposted at the bottom of that slide there. The project being presented today, it fits well under the remit of our IPM program through working to develop diagnostic assays, predict disease incidents, and ultimately develop diagnostic tests for pseudomonas and trichoderma that, through detecting a wider range of species, build on existing diagnostic tests. This project is also looking at different options for control of these diseases via irrigation treatments, biological control, and bacteriophages. Joanna Vicente, Ralph Noble and George Salmond will discuss some of their progress so far with this work and the next steps in developing diagnostic tests for industry. And we hope to update you further with practical project outcomes towards the end of this year. Before we kick off, I just want to run through some housekeeping elements. So for information throughout the webinar, the audience is muted. Um, but you can ask questions anonymously by submitting them through the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions after each session and at the end of the webinar. Um, it would be helpful if you could indicate who they're for. If you have any issue during the webinar, please also flag this via the questions box. Um, any questions we don't get to within um, this webinar, we'll try to answer after afterwards. Um, and please do email me on natalie.ahdb.org if you have any questions following the event. Basis and Enroso are available, so please complete the forms that you can download from the handouts box um, and return them to Maya, whose email is listed on the form if you'd like to claim these. The webinar will be recorded and made available on our events pages after the event. So please, you know, if you're very excited about it, you can watch it again or share it with um, your colleagues. Where possible, the presenter's webcams will be on, but where there are technical issues um, and to improve sound quality, they may be turned off. We should be finished by about 1.30 to 1.40, depending on how many questions we get in. Um, but for now, I will pass over to Joanna from Ferra to start us off. Thank you. You can see that, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, is it okay, my presentation? Looks good. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to update you today on the improvements that we've been doing on the mushroom project um, called Improve, Improved Understanding and Control of Bacterial Blotch and Green Mold in Mushroom Production. So what's the problem that we're dealing with? It's bacterial blotch. And this disease is caused uh, by several species of pseudomonas. And so we have here the most typical symptoms that we have seen in the UK. So we have brown blotch caused by Pseudomonas thalassi, uh, ginger blotch caused by Pseudomonas gingeri. Uh, this is not an official name so far. And also uh, another species, Pseudomonas costantini, that causes more of a pit symptom. And this can result in more than 10% of crop loss through spoilage and by limiting irrigation. And the main aims of this project is to develop strategies for early detection and control and to improve the understanding 
of microbial communities. So we're also looking at trichoderma green mold, and this disease can cause 5% of crop loss, and there's high tolerance to heat and disinfectants, and this um, then causes higher hygiene costs. And also there's a preference for peat substitutes, so the importance of this disease that was considered minor at some stages, uh, it might still uh, come back as more important in the future. So our project carries on from previous projects funded also by AHDB, and these are some of the conclusions of the previous projects, so just to give us a starting point. So Pseudomonas thalassi and gingery were differentiated from other Pseudomonas strains that, that strains that cause mild or no blotch by whole genome analysis. Then we had developed real-time PCR assays for Pseudomonas thalassi and some groups of Pseudomonas gingery. But we knew that other Pseudomonas species can also cause blotch and some even at low relative humidity. Pathogenicity bioassays had been developed, um, and there was an assay on a pot culture assay and the cut cap. I'll come back to this a bit later. And Ralph Noble and his team have developed enrichment methods. And this uses a compound during the incubation of casing samples and resulted in increase in the Pseudomonas populations when Pseudomonas thalassi and gingery were present, and this could have an advantage when detecting the pathogens. And Ralph will talk about this a bit later. So who's doing this project? So we have teams at FERA, Microbiotech and the University of Cambridge, and you'll hear from Ralph and George, Professor George Salmond a bit later. And so at FERA, um, John Elphinstone uh, designed this project, but he's now semi-retired, so I took, then took over. And we have a team, teams of in path, plant pathology um, and also the molecular biologists and the bioinformaticians. Ralph and Andrea have been doing mushroom bioassays, also gross human on-farm experiments and development the enrichment technology. And then at Cambridge, they're looking at bacteriophages and their characterization. We also have a range of commercial partners uh, from GEs to plant works, and we're very lucky that they're contributing to this project and participating in our meetings. And just going through the objectives in more detail, we want to have sensitive detection in fresh substrates of all blotch-causing Pseudomonas species and then see if this can be related to the occurrence of blotch and predict the disease risk. We want to determine the relative abundance of blotch-causing Pseudomonas, Trichoderma and other microorganisms, and this will be in different cropping substrates, different sources, in response to controlled treatments and at different stages of commercial production. And we want then to, like Natalie said, to uh, try different control options through irrigation with antagonists, bacteriophages and ionic solutions. And we want to make all the diagnostic tests available and disseminate the results to the industry. And this webinar is part of that effort. So when we started the project, we already had a good collection of bacterial isolates that cause blotch and that have been characterized in the previous projects. And to summarize what we had, we had three different groups of Pseudomonas gingery, and some of these groups can be detected by the existing qPCR assay, sorry, um, but one of the groups could not be detected. And these are pathogenic isolates. So we knew that something had to be developed for this group. Then we have Pseudomonas thalassi, and again, they can be detected by the existing assays from the previous project. Pseudomonas costantini could not be detected by the assays, and we also got some isolates that we got from the Netherlands of different species, 
that they characterized there, and they could not be detected by any existing assay. Some of these species might not be present in the UK. So this is just to show what the islets look on petri plates, uh, like um, fluorescent pseudomonas, very difficult to know what they are just by plating them. And we also had a collection of islets that are associated, that were found associated with mushroom production. They're from a range of different species and they were not pathogenic. And these have the potential to be used as antagonists. And I just highlighted one here that Ralph will talk about a bit later. And all of them were not detected by any of the two PCR assays. So during this project, we are increasing our collection of islets. And these are some of the symptoms of mushrooms that we received. And so we've made isolations from these symptoms. And we have uh, chestnut mushrooms and white mushroom and we obtain more islets from these. And one of the first things that we've been doing was to do cut cap assays to determine, this is a very quick test, it only takes two to three days to see symptoms. And this is very good to see symptoms of Pseudomonas thoracae, uh, also Costantini, quite clear. Then gingery, it's more difficult to see. Some of them are more clear than others, but they're a bit intermediate in this assay. So it's not the ideal assay for these islets. We did a pot bioassay um, with Ralph Noble at FERA, and this uh, is a much longer experiment. It involves a lot more work, but it's very, very good, for example, to see the symptoms of Pseudomonas gingery. And I just put here some of the mushrooms of, with symptoms from one of the new islets. These are some symptoms of uh, nislets from the UK of Pseudomonas costantini. This is um, Pseudomonas thalassi, and now we're using another strain that is stronger than this one. So during the previous project, uh, they have sequenced a large range of islets in collaboration with a team in Wageningen in the Netherlands. And this work was published last year. And it allows us to group the islets according to their sequences. And this, for example, has changed how we looked at gingery, because now we know that there's different groups uh, genetically. And uh, so this has changed how we're dealing with these islets. And based on genome sequences, um, uh, our bioinformaticians have designed new real-time PCR probes and we ordered 10 assays and they're aiming at the three groups of gingery islets at Costantini and some of the other species. So this was a preliminary assay. So we have our 10 new assays and these are control islets. And this uh, have CT values, U is undetected. The, these CT values, the lower they are, the more positive the assay is. So more DNA was present of this or, or from these organisms. And our assays were behaving exactly like predicted from the bioinformatics analysis. So they were differentiated the groups of gingery, they were detecting Constantini and this group that so far we only have the name NCO2 and we at the time we didn't have a good control for the Yamanorum species. So then we ran the best assays that we had so it was six new assays with all the new uh, islets that we've been getting from 2018 to 2020. And what have we found so far? We detected several times Pseudomonas costantini, several isos of Pseudomonas thalassi, and at least two different types of Pseudomonas gingeri. These are all islets that we know are pathogenic. We also have six islets that so far they have not been detected with any of the qPCR, not the previous ones and not the new ones, and so we still don't have a species for these six islets. 
Now, this is preliminary and we're still going to use the, to repeat the qPCR assays as they, it was only done once. But if we can't detect some of these islets, we are looking into sequence them to find out more about them. And these islets are all from different mushroom farms and all um, so um, not just one farm here. So just to make a summary of what we have so far. So we have Pseudomonas thalassi, and we could detect it before for, with the assays from the previous uh, project. And some groups of Pseudomonas gingeri we could also detect. But now in this project, we extended the range of islets that we're detecting. And so far in the UK, we think that we have uh, this species. Uh, with Talassi gingeri and Costantini being the most important ones. Now, the other species that were detected in the Netherlands, so far, we do not know if they're present in the UK. They might not be. Just to give you an update on what we have been doing on trichoderma. So there were four trichoderma biotypes that have now been included in different species and subspecies or former specialis. And so um, the main one that has been causing problems in the UK is Trichoderma aggressivum, former speciali europeum. And then there's a one islet that is a threat for the UK and for some other countries. This has been uh, causing problems in North America, but in Europe it has been detected in Hungary in 2015. Then other trichoderma species can cause some problems, but not at the same level. So we started by receiving some islets from Ralph Noble, and we also grew islets that were kept at Ferra, and some of these islets had come from the old uh, HRI collection and had been transferred to Ferra uh, during an AHDB project. We extracted DNA from all the islets and we sequenced, uh, partially sequenced two genes, ITS and uh, the elongation factor, to check their identification. Ralph will come back to this in a moment. And we then found that we didn't have a control of Trichoderma aggressivum, former specialis aggressivum, and so this was ordered from a culture collection. This is just to be used to extract DNA and to compare things in the lab not to be used in any other experiments. And what we would like to have will be um, PCR assays, or ideally even qPCR assays, to detect trichoderma at the genus level, trichoderma aggressivum at the species level, and then trichoderma aggressivum, well, especially former specialis europeum, so at the subspecies level. So we tested primers from two publications, and this one worked very well for us. It, it seems to be detecting all trichodermas from our collection and not other genera. It, it, they only missed one strain, but this could be a problem with the DNA. Um, we also tried some primers from this publication, but we had more cross reactions, so it didn't work as well for us. Then at the species level, we have the primers from Chen. That worked really well for us. And it gave us an identical result as the ferret commercial qPCR assays. Uh, at the subspecies, uh, then uh, just this one also gave us, uh, from Kasanovic, also gave us some more cross reactions. And at the subspecies level, the primers for, from Kosanovic um, worked quite well. So just to show you an example on a gel of some of the samples, this is Trichoderma europeum and aggressivum. And so this was the primus for the genus level, the species level, and the subspecies level. So these are our, our selected uh, PCR tests. So um, what are we still doing in this project in this last year? We want to work on the identification of a small number of islets that have not been detected by any qPCR. So we need to repeat some of the qPCR 
and then move for sequencing if necessary. We want to do some more pathogenicity tests using Ralph's new system, and this is especially for newer isolates that we recently got. And we want to continue in the qPCR development and then make the best assays available through FERA. And then we would also publish this. And we need to study the bacterial and fungal communities at different stages of production. And this has been the work that has been more delayed due to COVID problems, related problems. Ralph will touch on this work again in a minute. And this is just to say that there's a large team of people that have been working on this project, and I would just like to finish with an acknowledgement to all of them. Thank you very much. And I can now pass to Ralph Noble. Well, I think um, we might just have time for a quick question for you, Joanna, if you don't mind. OK, that's fine. Um, and please do feel free to submit any more um, if you're logged on. Um, are the isolates collected in this project, which are pathogenic, but that you have not been able to pick up with the existing diagnostic assays, likely to be non-pseudomonas blotch causing isolates yet to be detected in the UK? I think they will all be pseudomonas because of all the preliminary tests that we do at FERA when we do isolations but we are keeping our mind open about that and obviously if we move to sequencing we, we will know for sure what they are but it will be important to know if there are any of the species that they have detected in the Netherlands and also we want to test their pathogenicity carefully because some of them we have only done uh, cut cap assays so that's where new pathogenicity tests will be important as well so yeah, I think they will be quite important to look at, to know exactly what we have in the UK. Thank you. Um, so for now, we'll move on to Ralph. Um, we'll just pass screen control over to you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. You can see that. Thanks, Ralph. You can see that. That's good. OK. Um, so um, as uh, Joanna has mentioned, we uh, uh, have developed a new um, uh, pathogenicity test for blotch using these um, small pots. Um, and you can see here the, um, the symptoms of three types of blotch using this system. So the mushrooms are grown in small pots in uh, bags, so it keeps, uh, it stops cross-contamination of one uh, type of blotch to another, and uh, the, the clean pots stay clean. Um, so we've got uh, typical brown blotch, uh, ginger blotch, and pitting when these um, pots have been inoculated with these um, uh, species of pseudomonad. So it's a uh, it's a uh, a much better and easier method of examining blotch, uh, blotch than growing in large uh, larger containers or in um, larger systems. So using this um, system, we've investigated. Um, various methods to control uh, blotch disease. First of all, um, uh, different irrigation solutions, um, calcium chloride, uh, potassium chloride, uh, bicarbonate, hydrogen peroxide, and uh, compost tea. And we've looked at the control of brown blotch, ginger blotch, and uh, pitting. Um, we've also looked at the use of um, biological antagonists for controlling blotch. Um, so we've looked at commercial products. These are pseudomonads that are commercially available. Uh, that they're, they're not designed for controlling blotch. They're, they've been developed for controlling other uh, fungal pathogens in other other, other crops. Um, and we've also looked at a number of experimental um, pseudomonads isolates. Um, these the, these were um, obtained from the HRI culture collection and other sources. And again, we've looked at the uh, effect of these antagonists on the control of these three types of uh, blotch disease. Um, we found that the irrigation treatments and the commercial pseudomonads were not um, effective in controlling any of the types of blotch. And, and you can see here the results of um, inoculating these pots um, with 
uh, different types of blotch. So each graph is a different type of blotch. And then um, the pots were either um, irrigated with uh, water or with a suspension of these commercial um, pseudomonads. So you can see here, very clear result in terms of uh, blotch disease. So where no pathogen um, was applied, um, a small amount of background blotch, uh, casing material always has some um, background blotch um, organisms. Um, when we've um, inoculated with the Tulasi strain, very strong uh, blotch disease, almost no clean mushrooms, almost no blue bars in that graph. Uh, Costantini, also the isolate, uh, strongly pathogenic. Um, none of the um, antagonist treatments uh, significantly suppressed um, the pitting caused by Costantini or um, ginger blotch. So again, um, mainly diseased mushrooms, not many clean mushrooms when we've inoculated with the uh, gingery eye strain. Um, moving on to experimental pseudomonads. So um, we've uh, again um, uh, inoculated the pots with gingery eye and costantini. We, we didn't use um, Tulasi in this experiment. And then in addition, we've used these various um, experimental pseudomonads. Uh, and we can see in terms of gingery eye, when we've applied ginger eye and this antagonist 7759 we didn't get any ginger blotch mushrooms and uh, in in costantini um uh, we didn't get any pitted mushrooms whereas um in in the case of what when we just used water we got pitted mushrooms and uh, we got ginger ginger blotch um, none, none of these isolates um significantly affected the number of mushrooms um when there wasn't a pathogen present um, we've um, repeated the experiment, um, and uh, in, in this case, um, we did get some suppression with the uh, brown blotch um, talassi. When, when we just used water, we got almost 100% diseased mushrooms. Um, when we used the antagonist 7759, we reduced that to about uh, 50%. Of course, this is very high. Um, inoculum level, you wouldn't normally see 100% disease mushrooms. So we're using very strong um, high levels of inoculum and um, still getting some disease suppression. Um, it, it, it again um, suppressed uh, Costantini um, 7759, whereas without the antagonist, we did get pitted mushrooms. In this experiment, um, there wasn't an effect on the ginger blotch. We, um, we didn't find an effect of the antagonist on ginger blotch in this case, but again, a, a very high level of disease um, when we've applied the ginger blotch um, um, pathogen. So um, at the end of these experiments, we've taken samples and uh, extracted, uh, taken casing extracts and then tested them um, using the TACMAN analysis that Joanna has already explained. So there were three TACMAN tests, one for Tulasi, one for Gingerii, and one for Costantini. These are specific to these um, species. <clears throat> um, I've drawn a line here of, of a, um, a cutoff of about a value of about 30. So the bigger these values, the, the less pathogen or the more, more negative the test. Um, and, and the lower the value um, is the more, um, the more positive the test. So um, we can see in the water samples, we got some weak, weak, perhaps weak positives, some background level of pathogen in the uh, casing material. Where we've applied Tulasi, we get a very strong um, uh, result, a strong positive result for Tulasi using that test, negative for gingery eye and Costantini. Um, where we've applied ginger eye, we get a strong positive for the ginger eye test, negative for the Tulasi and uh, Costantini. And where we've applied uh, Costantini, we get a strong positive result for Costantini, uh, weak, weak results for Tulasi and Costantini. So the, the, these three tests are very discriminatory for the types of uh, blotch organism. Where, where we've applied the antagonist only, again, we didn't get a, any strong positives for any of the, um, the, the, the three tests. Um, interestingly, um, where we've um, uh, compared the control samples with 7759 using these three tests, so these these are mushrooms, um, mushroom pots 
inoculated with the Tulasi, with the ginger eye and the Coscantini. So even though we have suppressed the disease, we haven't um, reduced the amount of pathogen present. So um, it, this, this um, result with the presence of the antagonist is, is certainly not lower than without the antagonist, although we have suppressed the disease. So it seems we're suppressing disease, but not um, reducing the amount of uh, pathogen inoculum. So um, just to um, conclude what we found with irrigation and biocontrol treatments, the irrigation treatments that we've looked at, these um, ionic solutions such as calcium chloride, were not effective in controlling blotch uh, of, of any of these types of blotch. And also the commercial strains of pseudomonads that we've used were ineffective. However, this um, pseudomonas reactants, P7759, has suppressed pitting uh, by Costantini in, in two experiments. Um, it's suppressed brown blotch in, in the one experiment where we've used it, and it's suppressed ginger blotch in one out of two experiments. Um, and this, this um, antagonist has suppressed blotch, but it does not reduce the uh, pathogen inoculum. Um, so the next um, aspect of this project is um, enriching pseudomonads in casing above detectable limits. One of, one of the problems is that uh, raw casing material, um, although the pathogens may be present, they're at such a low level, we aren't able to detect them using the, um, the TACMAN analysis in, 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 in just the straight water extracts. So, um, so what we've attempted is to try Enrich, to enrich these populations, to boost the um, population using um, one octin three ol. This is a this is a, a, um, a volatile given off by the mushroom, and it's very uh, selectively available to pseudomonads that um, grow on mushrooms. Obviously, they um, they're adapted to using this uh, molecule because it's a mushroom um, volatile. And then we've tested the extracts with and without this um, enrichment compound um, using a selective agar and using the Tacman analyses for the different types of pseudomonad. Um, so um, if we look at the um, uh, results with the um, enrichment, um, uh, sorry, the um, selective agar, um, we see in, in the control samples just um, um, uh, treated with water. So the, this is just the background pseudomonads. The casing has pseudomonads in it. They, they may not be pathogens, but there's a background population. And you can see um, the one octan 3 ol has, hasn't really increased the um, population very much. And, and the same applies to when the um, antagonist, the 7759, um, there's a, uh, the, slightly higher than the control because we've applied the antagonist, but it's not really affected by the um, the, the enrichment compound, the one octan 3 ol Interestingly, where we've applied uh, pathogen inoculum, um, the overall pseudomonad population goes down a bit. The, applying these pathogens seems to reduce the, um, the population compared to the, um, the control population. But the um, adding the one octan 3 ol as I say, it's a mushroom volatile and it seems to stimulate the growth of these um, pathogen pseudomonads. So we get a fivefold increase in the um, population in the extract when we've applied either Costantini, ginger eye or Tulasi. So um, we have been able to boost the, um, uh, the population of uh, pseudomonads in the extract. Um, we, we haven't found um, an, um, an increase in the detection limits of the, um, the TACMAN assay, but of course we have a very high uh, uh, pathogen inoculum level, and it, it may be interesting to look at a, um, a lower pathogen uh, inoculum level, perhaps in the raw casing material, to see if we can boost the population to a detectable um, limit using the TACMAN um, analysis. So um, to conclude the enrichment technique, um, pseudomonas populations of pathogens are in, um, in inoculated casing extracts are increased by fivefold with one octan 3 ol and there's no effect of the one octan 3 ol on pseudomonads in the control or the um, antagonist uh, inoculated casings. Um, the TACMAN assays have correctly detected Tulasi, ginger eye and Costantini in casing samples um, when those um, casings have been inoculated with those pathogens. 
Um, but the TACMAN detection limit was not improved by the one octane three hole treatment. But as I say, that is in uh, inoculated pots, and it will be interesting to see um, the effect on uh, raw casing material. Can, can we detect these pathogens using an enrichment technique? So, um, current and forthcoming work on blotch. Um, we're um, looking at microbial communities in mushroom uh, during cropping from commercial farm samples. And we anticipate um, obtaining further blotch pathogens and antagonists that we can use as biocontrol agents. Um, we intend to validate the blotch and pseudomonad assays on commercial, commercial casing samples. So uh, can we detect the pathogens in, in raw casing material? Um, we'll be um, evaluating uh, phages for blotch control in pot experiments, and uh, George Salmon's going to talk more about phages after, after, after I've finished. And we're examining the use of a commercially uh, uh, produced uh, P7759 uh, produced by uh, Plantworks, and we're going to evaluate that in both uh, uh, pot experiments and on uh, commercial farm experiments. Um, uh, in terms of commercial samples, we've collected um, samples from uh, different farms. This is right through the uh, cropping stage from uh, casing to the end of crop. Um, samples with and without uh, specific diseases in them. And uh, we'll find out at what stage of the crop does the uh, pathogen become um, apparent? When can we start detecting the blotch organism during a cropping cycle? Um, we, we've also got samples of different symptoms of blotch. This is um, the, this is a, um, uh, 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 symptoms on heirloom. We're getting this brown uh, rotting stipe symptom. Um, also on heirloom, brown mushroom, getting this very dark blotch on the on the bottom of the uh, on the bottom of the cap. So uh, finally, just to move on to uh, trichoderma, I'll work on uh, green mold. Um, we're um, collecting new isolates from on farm. Um, uh, Joanna's already mentioned some of the uh, aggressive isolates that we've collected. Um, we're using uh, existing molecular techniques to, to um, species type these isolates. Um, we're using the small pot bioassay for green mold control strategies. Um, we're determining the pathogenicity of different isolates we've obtained and uh, testing biological control agents for um, control. So um, these, um, Joanna's already mentioned this, these are some of the um, isolates we've um, obtained from farm in the, in the last 18 months. You can see aggressive them, um, still quite prevalent uh, in a number of farms. Um, this is the pot bioassay that we use to test the um, pathogenicity of um, uh, uh, green mold, uh, samples. We, we have here a spore uh, suspension and here 0.1% uh, infected compost. We got this level from a previous um, um, project that we did with um, Helen Grogan and we, we use this 0.1% uh, infected compost level which was like the threshold for causing disease but you, you can see here this, this was a bit of overkill but this is far too much so we, we have to reduce this amount of um, inoculum. So uh, um, we've looked at the um, um, pathogenicity of different isolates that we've obtained. Um, uh, this is this is a number of mushrooms in the, in a pot experiment. Two of the isolates we didn't able to we weren't able to get any green mold. This um, third isolate much more pathogenic and is the one we'll use in further experiments. Sometimes. Um, surprisingly, it's quite difficult to get green mold in an experiment. So um, we've got this isolate here that's giving um, very uh, reliable um, disease symptoms. Um, and we're looking at uh, biological control of green mold. Uh, it's known that some uh, bacillus species are suppressive to uh, green mold. And uh, we're using this uh, bacillus subtilis uh, type. Um, it's got this uh, AHDB code. And we're looking to see if this will uh, suppress uh, uh, trichoderma aggressivum in uh, compost. So that, that's just a summary of our um, sort of applied work on uh, bacterial blotch and uh, green mold. Um, 
and uh, I've, I've mentioned fate and I and um, George is going to uh, talk about that after me. Thank you very much Ralph. Um, I've just got one question for you at the moment and then um, we'll probably just pass over to George. Um, are there any other biological control agents that you're going to trial um, on trichoderma other than the bacillus? Do you have any plans um, for that? Yeah, uh, it, it, I think it depends on the results we get with bacillus. If it looks uh, if it looks promising, that, that's something we might compare with other uh, biological control agents. Um, I think at the moment the the work on bacterial blots looks very promising. So you have to focus a bit on the most promising um, aspects yeah. of the project. And it, if narrow if that we have to narrow it down, um, mm -hmm. we haven't got. Um, a large number of years left on this uh, project so i think we have to focus on the things that look most promising that sounds sensible um so thank you very much for that ralph then um, there may be some more questions at the end for you but um at the okay. moment we'll Good. pass over to to george Good. thank you Great, thanks, George. We can see that. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so my part of the project is to look at bacteriophages as potential natural biocontrol agents um, against the uh, pseudomonads involved in this project. So the aims here are listed as with, is it possible to isolate bacteriophages that affect Tolassi? And, and when we can, what are they in terms of their electron microscopy, their image? Can we determine anything about their genomics? And do they have capacity for biocontrol in terms of their host range of the pathogen, the efficacy? And that's both under lab conditions, but in Ralph's pot assays, and, and then finally in, in an industrial setting. So in case you're unaware, what are bacteriophages, sometimes just referred to as, as phages? They are actually bacterial viruses. And um, I guess in the current pandemic climate, the, the use of the term viruses is somewhat uh, uh, worrying, but in fact, these viruses only have the capacity to infect bacteria. They don't infect fungi, they don't infect plants, don't infect animals, and of course, humans. And so they're not deleterious to other hosts. Um, they're abundant in nature. It's been estimated that there's something of the order of 10 to the power 31 bacterial viruses uh, on the planet. Indeed, that makes them the most abundant biological entities on Earth. Um, they have very useful traits that can be exploited. Uh, for example, we can exploit their host specificity, and that's at a species level in terms of the bacterial species, but also in terms of particular strains. One advantage, of course, is that they're natural. Their natural products are organic products, uh, and so they're not chemical derivatives of anything that, that, that can be useful. Uh, that makes them environmentally friendly, and they're capable of uh, replication. And of course, relative to uh, some chemical methods, such as antibiotics, et cetera, they're pretty cheap. So one question is, are there examples of commercial uses of phages in agriculture or horticulture? I'll come back to that in a second, but I just want to tell you a little bit more about bacteriophages. And you can see that they're, they, they come in different flavors here. They, you, they can have a genomes which are made of RNA, um, or they can have genomes that are made of DNA, and, and they can be single-stranded or double-stranded. Um, these bacteriophages down here are the most common phages that can be isolated in nature. You can also isolate filamentous bacteriophages and some other uh, structures but these ones here are the most common and this group here um, these examples that are given are really for bacteriophages that infect E. coli um, but this group here um, I'll show you in a second are quite common in this project. In terms of the phage replication cycle this is how they work. Bacteriophages absorb to the surface of the bacterial cell and they absorb in a very specific way to very specific receptors that are exposed on the cell surface. They then inject their genome into the bacterial cell, essentially like a bit like a hypodermic syringe. And then that viral genome essentially takes over the cell. 
and converts the cell into a, a manufacturing plant for the production of new virus particles. So these, virus, these bacteriophages are incapable of replication on their own. They are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to grow inside a bacterial cell. <clears throat> so when the bacterial genome is expressed, uh, then, as I said, the bacterial cell is, is taken over as a production plant for virus particles. All the different component parts of the virus are, are synthesized and then assembled together in a very programmed morphogenetic assembly pathway. And eventually, for most bacteriophages, the, the host cell goes into lysis and bursts open to release new progeny virus particles. And that can be as many as, say, 100 virus particles from an infected cell. So this is the replication cycle. Because we have a lysis phenomenon going on here, it's called the lytic cycle. OK, so one question I asked in a, in a slide a couple of slides ago was, uh, are there commercial examples of uses of phages in biocontrol? And there's a good uh, UK example up in Dundee, the company APS um, Biocontrol, use bacteriophages in a product called Biolyze, um, a liquid product. And that's used for the post-harvest potato treatment um, to increase shelf life against bacterial soft rocks due to things like pecked bacteria. In the US, the company Omnilytics has multiple products um, which are uh, phage-based uh, against a, a range of plant pathogenic bacteria, uh, Xanthomonas erwinia, Cladobacter xanthomonas again, and Pseudomonas. So uh, there are commercial examples out there. There are products out in the field. So how do we find these phages? Well, this is the River Cam in Cambridge. Uh, here we have just a, a bunch of uh, mushrooms which are effectively decomposing, and we have a production plant here. So we take a water sample in this case. It's filtered to remove any um, bacteria. And it's then added to a culture of what we would call a bait strain. So in this case, we would have a Pseudomonas thalassi host strain. That's added into a culture, in this case, a called L broth, and so the bacteria will grow in there. And the expectation here, or the, the hope, is that somewhere in that sample, that river water sample, or indeed an extract taken from other samples, we hope that there is at least one bacteriophage that will recognize this bait strain, the Pseudomonas thalassi. And if it, if it is, you saw in a previous slide how it absorbs and replicates, it will then absorb and replicate to the bacterial bait strain. And so over a period of time, say over a day or several days, um, that virus, um, even though it may only be present in the original uh, sample at very, very low level, it will, will amplify. So that's an, an enrichment, a very strong enrichment. There may be multiple logs going from, say, you know, uh, one phage particle to 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. Um, that sample is then chlor uh, chloroform treated to, to um, uh, remove any uh, uh, potentially pathogenic organisms and kill all the bacteria and leave essentially a supernatant, which is then titrated onto this host bait strain again. So here is an example of an agar plate. And across here, we have a lawn of the bait strain. And you can see these individual plaques. So these individual plaques represent initially um, single viral particles which have absorbed and injected and replicated locally at the site of infection. So these plaques represent uh, bacteriophages, which are capable of infecting the bait strain. So using that very standard um, method of enrichment, we've isolated a, a, a large number of bacteriophages. And here are just uh, some examples here, just to make the point that um, in terms of the plaque morphology, some of these can be curved, or some of them can be clear. So we, again, we have a lawn of the bacterial host here, and the virus is replicating within the plaque. Um, by uh, electron microscopy, you can see that the, the, the structures look very similar for all these different independently isolated bacteriophages. And in fact, uh, these structures are very characteristic of the so-called podoviridae family. So they have very short, stumpy tails, a capsid, and the, the genome of the virus will be inside the head of that. Now, I'm going to come back to a couple of these uh, bacteriophages in a second. 
Now, we know a lot about the genomes of uh, uh, some of these phages, and um, I'm highlighting this one here, MB55, and this one here, MB56. And this, um, this method of analysis of the genomes, um, uh, we don't need to go into any detail here. Essentially, what's happened here is we've linearized the sequence of each bacteriophage. So that's one, two, three, four, uh, and then this one copied at the end. And what this uh, program does is it looks at that sequence and compares the sequences. So if you compare, say, this one, MB55, with this one, JB27, these two here, everything that's red here shows sequence identity. Everything that's white, the gaps, represent dissimilarity where there are differences. So, for example, 55 and 27, you can see there are extensive red patches here. So there's very, very similar gene sequences here, but there clearly are some significant differences as well. And there are even more differences here between 27 and tall one, more white patches. If we go over here, these are the clear plaques that we see. Then again, a lot of similarity. So uh, I should also say that these phages don't really show any similarity, significant similarity with these clear flag phages. So at least for those phages we've, we've analyzed here, they fall into two major uh, groups, the so-called LUS24 light phages and the T7 light phages. But within each of these groups, they show significant similarities, but also significant differences. Okay, so we've used some of these phages in very, very crude laboratory-based uh, attempts at uh, analysis of potential biocontrol. And this is cutting um, the caps off uh, uh, mushrooms. So what we have here are uh, a measurement of the, what we would call the pitting zone or the, uh, the browning zone. Here is just uh, uninfected. That's just the L broth that the bacteria normally grow in. And obviously there's no pitting. Here is the wild type, and you can see extensive um, browning here, and here's the degree of pitting. And here is um, that same strain, but along with the, the first bacteriophage, MB55, and here we are uh, recording the multiplicity of infection. That means the number of virus particles per bacterial cell. So MOI means if there's an MOI of one, there's one virus particle per bacterial cell. And I hope you can see that the, uh, the amount of pitting or, or uh, um, browning has decreased relative to the sample, the wild type, which hasn't been exposed to the bacteria branch. The other um, point here is that if you increase the multiplicity, in other words, you're adding, adding more virus particles, 10 times more than the, in this experiment, then the, the amount of um, uh, pitting zone uh, decreases. Um, and 56, the, the different phage, uh, you can see that that is, um, at least in terms of the pitting zone, is more effective than the one that was the turbid plant. So we do see differences in potential biocontrol between the different bacteria factors. We've also uh, started enrichments with samples from uh, various uh, industrial samples uh, from uh, uh, the manufacturers uh, listed here. And uh, um, Jessica Bergman, postdoc in the lab, has been uh, dealing with this, sending out um, requests for samples from various uh, producers. And we have done enrichments with some of these as well. And just to give you a feeling for some of the examples here, here are some of the bacteriophages uh, produced by enrichment uh, with different host strains, so telases and ginger eyes, and the source of the enrichment sample, the river, or from various uh, manufacturer samples. So we've been able to isolate um, a range of different bacterial functions. And uh, I've shown you in a previous slide, MB55 and MB56, the turbid plaque version and the clear plaque version, and I showed you the, uh, the EM picture. But I just wanted to put this up because this is quite a recent uh, result from um, a Joshua Western uh, a technician in the lab. Just to make the point here, here is a, a lawn of Pseudomonas gingeri. And what you can see here uh, is pretty obvious. These are enormous plaques, certainly compared with any of the other phages we've isolated. So we now have phages against Pseudomonas gingeri 
which are producing these enormous plaques, and we think these are virulent phages, which are very aggressive against pseudomonas gingeri. Um, and uh, we're, we're hoping to do some uh, um, bioassays and uh, biocontrol experiments with these as well. Okay, so in summary, yes, we do have phages that affect the uh, pseudomonas thalassi and pseudomonas gingeri as looking by enrichment. Sources include river water and commercial production plants. Uh, it depends which host you're using as the bait strain for the enrichment, because some bacterial host strains are better or more permissive for enrichment hosts uh, as enrichment hosts than others. Uh, and we've got phages that will differentiate between pseudomonas thalassi and pseudomonas ginger strain. We've characterized them by a transmission electron microscopy. We've got many phage genome sequences now. And we've got uh, at least two distinct phage families, there may be others. And at least under very crude lab conditions, we've been able to show potential uh, capacity for biocontrol. So what we're doing now in red here are more enrichments, uh, extending the phage host range analysis and more genomics, all of that is in progress. And as uh, Ralph mentioned, we are uh, um, moving these uh, phages, uh, the characterized phages, up to um, the FIRA to do the, the mushroom pot tests uh, uh, as a kind of prelude, a, a proof of principle in, in those assays to see if the phages will be effective under, uh, let's say, slightly more realistic conditions. And then <clears throat> eventually uh, the potential for biocontrol will be assessed under industrial circumstances. So um, various people in the lab have been involved in this, but I, I want to highlight uh, Dr. Jessup, Jessup Berg, Bergman, who's postdoc in the lab, uh, the technician and now an MPhil student, Josh Western, and Megan Booth, who was a previous MPhil student who did some of the early, early work. Okay. Thank you very much, George. Um, got a couple of questions for you. Um, if well, actually, if the speakers want to put their cameras on, we can have a little uh, little panel session. Thank you. And if you just stop sharing your slides, George, if you can, or Maya could maybe help. <laughs> um, nope. so, Sorry. That's okay. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you. Um, so for George, um, is there any way to determine from gene sequencing which phages may be more effective on particular disease? I think that's likely to be very problematic to be able to predict that. Um, mm. Really, it has to be a, a, an experiment to, to check that out um, because the uh, there are obvious things in the, in the bacteriophage genomes that might be predictive to some extent. So, for example, the way the bacteriophage absorbs onto the surface of the bacterium, um, there are particular sequences there that predict the, the sequence of the, the proteins of the bacteriophage that link onto the surface of the bacterium. Mm. But uh, it's virtually impossible to predict that. Mm. I guess I sort of in like. Sorry, I should, I should say that we, we know quite a bit about the, um, uh, the, the nature of the bacteriophage receptors on the bacterial uh, pathogen as well. Now, I haven't, I haven't described any of that so far. That's um, in progress. Okay. Um, I guess something that's linked to that is, um, as there are a vast number of phages, I mean, it sounds like an impossible question to ask, answer, really, but as there are a vast number of phages, what is the scope of finding phages that have a biocontrol effect on specific pseudomonas? <laughs> Trial and error, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the, that's the whole point of the enrichment process. Mm. So that e even if, even if uh, a, a, a phage that you would wish to have is, even if it's stunningly rare, you know, one virus particle in, you know, a liter of the river can, um, then the enrichment process will enrich for that on your particular enrichment host. So um, uh, that, that number of greater than 10 to the power of 31 phages, that, that, that's a global number. The, the key mm -hmm. question, can, can you find phages for your particular strain 
your particular species, your particular genus. And that involves enrichment, finding the phages, and then screening um, against particular hosts to determine host strength. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, one of our audience members has got his hand up. I don't know whether that was intentional, but I'm gonna have a go at um, unmuting him. Brendan, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, two uh, questions for Ralph and the stipe uh, discoloration. You were saying that's that's a result of blotch infection. Uh, it could be bacterial. I'm not saying it's blotch, but it's a bacterial, uh, probably a bacterial pathogen. We have an isolate of that, so we'll we'll, we'll find out if it's a pseudomonad or a different um, bacterial. That, I've, I've always explained it to a grower as being an evaporation issue and evaporate low caused by low evaporation. So I'm uh, I'm clearly mistaken. Um, yeah, I don't think that's a physiological. Um, I think that's a, an infectious. From what what we saw, that's an infectious um, disease. It's not a physiological disorder. And um, and how does the infectious? How does the infection get into the centre of the stipe? Um, good question. Um, yeah, at what stage does it infect the um, initial or the, um, the 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 fruit body? I don't know. Um, but um, it, it, it seemed that, that that particular problem seemed to be infectious. It seemed to be going from one crop into the next. Um, but we don't yeah, know if maybe, it's a pseudomonas. Maybe. It might be a different, uh, a different bacterial species. Right. And then question for George on, on the uh, saying that uh, phage is maybe not so expensive. Any idea the kind of what? kind of price the existing commercial phages are sold for the one for potatoes or that kind of thing just just trying to get a handle on the on the on the possible cost to 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 industry in in terms of using products like this yeah i, I wouldn't know what the um the commercial prices would be for for those products um but uh, you know that that information would be on the APS either on the website or by uh, by inquiry, and uh, the same for um, the um, omnilytics in in the USA. I don't I don't have a, a feeling for what that price is. You know the, you know that may be commercially sensitive, but I I, I wouldn't know what that is at the moment. Yeah. Uh, no, by, it's by, it's just it, the blotch does cause a constant or a certain kind of commercial loss, so there's an obvious potential value in anything if it works, if it, if it solves the problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the, I use the term cheap because they're, they're certainly cheap to isolate. Um, it's not like developing an antimicrobial, like an antibiotic or an antifungal or something like that, 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 that may involve uh, um, quite difficult uh, chemistry and biochemistry. Bacteriophages are, uh, for isolation, um, are relatively cheap. But of course, the the commercial costs would be, would be quite a different um, issue. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for me, Brendan? No, no, I'm good. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we've just got a couple more. Um, hold on a second. Just get the, the right window up. Um, so for Ralph, in the Mush TV project, a bacillus-based biocontrol was tested against trichoderma and other fungal pathogens and found not to be effective. How do you think the biocontrol product tested against trichoderma in this project will be different? Yeah, um, I think more recent to the uh, Mush TV uh, project has been um, quite a lot of work in France. INRA have done quite a lot of work looking at bacillus suppression of trichoderma aggressivum. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the bacillus has given mixed results um, in terms of suppression of green mold, um, but there's, there's, there's some uh, uh, French work and there's a paper um, on, on using bacillus to um, suppress trichoderma aggressivum. So um, yeah, there have, there have been uh, mixed results with um, different um, bacillus isolates. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and I think just one final one for George. What is the regulatory framework for using bacteriophage for disease control? Right, there's a lot of uh, work going on in, in terms of developing uh, or adapting to regulatory frameworks for the use of bacteriophages for the treatment of human and animal uh, infections. That, that's quite a big area within the European community. Um, in terms of um, um, agriculture and horticulture, um, the, that has to have been worked out, at least in the States, because uh, uh, companies like Omnilytics clearly have products which are um, under control. You know, the, let's say the, to, to sell those products, they have to be um, under control of the, uh, the American authorities. So I, I don't know quite um, how tight that is, but I expect it to be very rigorous. In terms of the UK, I'm really not um, aware of, since there's not exactly a plethora of products out there. Um, the uh, situation for APS, of course, is that they use um, phages against bacterium to spray onto uh, potatoes as the potatoes are being coming through the washing cycle and then they get they dry out essentially with phages on the surfaces. Um, um, and of course they're natural. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what the regulatory control systems are there. Um, but again, that company would, would have been through that, um, that uh, control uh, analysis. So yeah, something we'll have to consider as we get further along with this project. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that may be a, an important uh, downstream issue. Yeah. Um, I think that's it for questions. So um, I'm just going to wrap up. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, so, so um, thank you for all your questions, and thank Thank you very much to um, Joanna, Ralph and George for their presentations. If there are further questions, please do submit them to me um, by email. And to remind you, uh, the webinar recording will be made available on our events archive pages um, and we will be presenting further progress from this project later in the year. So please keep an eye out for future events. Um, one thing I did actually mean to say was that um, if there are growers on the on the um, webinar that would be interested in us samples, um, that's something that we are interested in. So please email me again after after the webinar, and um, we can sort out those details. Um, you can also make the most of other upcoming horticulture webinars on our events pages, and um, you can register register there for those. So I think. That's all we've got time for. So thank you for listening um, and I hope you have a good day. Goodbye.